Hello, BookTube. The weather today was accurately forecast to be freakishly temperate for the, what is, after all, the middle of winter. The temperatures went up to early spring. Uh, shirt sleeve weather. And the sky started off cloudy, but bro broke up into sunlight, and there was no wind. And knowing all that ahead of time, I thought, you know, I should take advantage of that and go to the Brattle Bookshop. For those of you who are new, there are quite a few new people to the channel. The Brattle Bookshop is a great used bookstore in downtown Boston that I just love. There have been times when I've gone there every day, and it has such an enormous, really rapid turnover in, in terms of the books that it gets that you can go every day and see something new. And in addition to the bookstore itself, there's a sale lot next door. The, not, the lot, you know, that would be another building or a parking lot elsewhere, is a lot that the Brattle gives over to $3, $1, and $5 books, uh, where it's possible to spend the most blissful hour in the world out there in the lot and come away with a shoulder bag groaning with books without uh, breaking the bank. Uh, and a temperate day makes shopping and browsing around in that outdoor sale lot bearable. I will, I have in the past done it when it was bitterly cold, uh, but it, 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 it kind of robs it of the charm. So, so I thought I would do that today. Uh, so I got myself ready and out I went. And uh, it was only once I was well and truly committed and on the, the subway headed to the Brattle. It's not far from me at all, but it was only once I was well and truly committed that I realized to my horror that everyone around me on the subway car was already drunk, even though it was late morning, and several of them had their faces painted. And that's when I realized that I had voluntarily launched myself into the Patriots Parade Day here in Boston. The New England Patriots, in a triumph of electronic eavesdropping on the team's plans of their opponents, won the Super Bowl again. And so Boston is giving them a parade. And that is an excuse, oh my god, for rampant amounts of drinking and debauchery. Uh, and ordinarily, therefore, it would be a perfect opportunity to stay as far away from the city of Boston as possible. And there I was in the middle of it. So I, I steeled myself and I went to the Brattle Bookshop. Even though the sidewalks were streaming with people screaming at each other, yelling, where's Sully? Have you seen Sully? And already bleary-eyed, staggering drunk at, at 11 in, in the morning. The Brattle was, uh, to put it mildly, untrafficked. <laughs> and I, despite the dice, the diciness of how I got there, I ended up finding a bunch of books that I want to show you. Uh, that uh, 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 It was a good trip to the Brattle. Not, not a huge number of books, but I hope well chosen. <laughs> uh, the first one is this, an oversized thing. It's an illustrated history of England. Uh, this one is by John Burke with an author, uh, a forward by Arthur Bryant, who also wrote A History of England. And I, this, this sort of thing was on my mind. Obviously, this is going to need some help. It's going to need some loving care here. But this sort of thing was on my mind because I just recently read and reviewed another book like this, The Story of Britain uh, by Roy Strong. And there are plenty of others. I think there's another one coming out this year. Uh, the, the turmoil over Brexit will bring a lot of those books out of the woodwork. Uh, and as I've mentioned on this channel, when you get something like this, something that's not very long and purports to be the entire history of England, you're not, you're not going to go to a book like this for any kind of granular or in-depth historical research. A person, I won't say that it's true of John Burke, but a person being approached by mckay books and being told we'd like a one volume history of england uh could you have it for us in six months here's your contract a person being approached by them could be forgiven for and most have often done just going to the, the encyclopedias at the library and cobbling something together without even though the book will be shelved in history and is called a history without doing any historical research Books like this tend to be like that. So you don't go to them for historical research. You go to them for something else. You go to them for uh, the pithiness of the author, for the, you know, for the, the company that the author is, rather than for what you can learn just as expeditiously in an encyclopedia entry or on Wikipedia. Uh, so that's the reason that I got this. And uh, I thought we'd go to page 112 and see if the writing does show pith. Uh, so let's see. Let's see what we have for, for page 112. Uh, Elizabeth provided shelter, but no support. Mary, that's got to be Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, was a dangerous guest. 
As a direct descendant of Henry VII through the line untainted by charges of illegitimacy, she was in Catholicized the rightful Queen of England as well as Scotland. A large minority of Catholics also looked to her as the person most likely to restore the old faith. Even if she genuinely wished at the start to be no embarrassment to Elizabeth, Mary's desire to recapture her Scottish throne involved her in many interchanges of secret and often ambiguous letters. Walsingham, that's Francis Walsingham, Elizabeth's uh, spy chief, uh, his spies brought details of so many papist plots that Elizabeth had to order a string of executions. Jesuit priests were smuggled into England to preach regicide to those Catholics who had too meekly accepted the Protestant regime. A mixed force of Spaniards and Italians was sent to Ireland to stir up rebellion. Burley urged the Queen not merely to provide military aid to the Protestant resistance movement in the Spanish Netherlands, but also to safeguard herself and her own country by removing the centerpiece of Catholic troublemaking, the Queen of Scots. Elizabeth procrastinated, even when presented with evidence that Mary had condoned a plot to assassinate her, but at last signed the death warrant, typically denying later that she had meant it to be carried out so briskly. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's uh, that's kind of good. Uh, I like the I like the crispness of that prose. I don't. Uh, there's a a little bit of a dodge going on in that paragraph. That the author seems to be saying uncritically, unironically, that Mary was offering that Elizabeth was offering Mary shelter in England. M Mary was not free to leave. <laughs> that's not shelter. <laughs> there's another word for that. Uh, but still, uh, I I don't think I've ever read this book. So and it was you know all these things were dirt cheap or free as I had quite a bit of credit, uh, so uh, I will I will read through this just because these things are always fun and there may be an observation that I can use the next time I review a one volume history of England, uh, and then we'll move on. This one this next one is a trade paperback and it it's not a particularly well made trade paperback so it it I'll reinforce it but I will be on the lookout for a hardcover if I I don't think I've ever seen a hardcover of this book. It's a classic. <laughs> it's uh, it's by George Willison, and it's Saints and Strangers. There's a misty ship on the cover, and this is his his great account of uh, well, what's the subtitles? Being the lives of the Pilgrim Fathers and their families with their friends and foes, and that's all that this is. It's, it's just an exhaustive and wonderfully witty account of the Pilgrims. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, this is from. Eons ago, this book is from the 1940s. Uh, but if I remember correctly, it starts off. You get a taste of that wit right away, because the author has to start off a book like this with Plymouth Rock. Uh, do you remember that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, on the American horizon today, Plymouth Rock looms like a Gibraltar. Uh, in our eyes, it has become the symbol of a great faith and a greater hope, a mighty bulwark of freedom and democracy. No landmark on our shores has been more celebrated in song and story. Yet this has not long been so. For a century and a half after the landing of the Pilgrims, the rock lay unremarked, almost unnoticed. Until 1769, on the eve of independence, it was just another gray granite boulder, one more troublesome bit of glacial debris littering a white arc of beach, impeding development of a busy waterfront, and cursed by many as an obstacle to progress. For another century, it was dragged, a broken and mutilated fragment, up and down the streets of Plymouth, first to Town Square to make a revolutionary holiday, then to Pilgrim Hall as a museum piece, an altar of pileal piety, restored at length to the beach and enshrined below a box of bones, presumably pilgrims, <laughs> embedded in the domed ceiling of an elaborate Victorian stone canopy, the rock enjoyed half a century of comparative quiet and repose, before it was snatched up again in our day, and dumped where it has since remained, at Tidewater, sheltered and quite overshadowed by a lustrous Grecian temple of Quincy granite. Here, much like a bear in a pit and not a great deal larger, it lies enclosed within a stout iron paling, dreaming, perhaps, of other days when it was not gathering moss and peanuts and odd bits of lunch tossed at it by casual sightseers and not being apostrophized by every hungry aspirant to public office. <laughs> you gotta love that aside that the, the bones are presumably pilgrim bones <laughs> and the book is all like that very dry uh, New York humor very wonderful from beginning to end I don't have a copy uh, I had a copy of this once upon a time I think I wrote it up for Steve Reed it's a long night a long, last time I found a copy and it went away probably sent it to somebody so now I found it again I will reinforce this this paperback but I would really like a hardcover uh then, this next one, uh, I did not know that this existed. This is by Del Rey, 
uh, books. I did not know that they ever did this. Somehow I must have missed this. This had to have been in bookstores when I worked in bookstores, but I must not have seen it. Uh, this is Harry Turtle Love, and this is the Videso cycle. This is book one and book two, The Misplaced Legion and The Emperor for the Legion. Uh, and th this is a trade paperback. The original Videsos novels came out, came out in mass market paperbacks with Rowena covers, if I remember correctly, for the first few. It's a great uh, premise. That a Roman legion in the time of Julius Caesar is in Gaul, marching along a road, when they encounter uh, a Gaulish force. And the leader of the, the Roman legion, Marc Marcus Aemilius Scarus, has a sword that was, that was enchanted by a sorcerer, by a Celtic sorcerer. And it turns out that the leader of the Celtic forces that they encounter in the woods also has an enchanted sword. And when the two of them fight and the swords meet, something occult or eldritch happens, and all of a sudden, Marcus Aemilius Scarus's legion finds itself in the world of Videssos. There's still a legion. They still have legion, you know, coherence and the rules and the layers of rank and also the priceless Roman training. But they are in a totally different world. And it's a great series. I read, I got the Vizessos books in Mass Market back when Mass Market paperbacks were affordable. I gobbled them right up. Just, they're just fantastic. Uh, and I did not know that, that Del Rey had ever com compiled any of these into books. I'm wondering if there are other Vizessos volumes. There would probably be two more. I don't remember exactly when the Vizessos novels stopped. I stopped before they did. But I don't remember how many of them there ended up being. But uh, this is wonderful. This is this is uh, old-fashioned military science fiction and fantasy of a type that I know I will reread. If I had the Videsos novels, I'd be a happy camper. <laughs> so so now I have those. Did not know that existed. I'll have to look around and see if there are other Videsos compil compilations that maybe I would find. And you know what I say about the Brattle. The odd uh, karma of the Brattle is that uh, a lot of times, if there are multiple volumes connected they will have been sold together. They will have been bought together and sold together, packed and boxed together, and will turn up together. So seeing this makes me think that I might, if there are other volumes, and if this the original owner of this book had those other volumes, I will see them soon at the Prattle. That that often happens. That that very often happens. Worthwhile to remember that when you go to the Prattle. That if you, for instance, if you're out in the, the sale carts and you, uh, you see uh, books in a series and you see book two and three, and they're a dollar a piece, you should get them because you're going to see book one. If you go back, you're going to see book one. And if you wait until all three are out in the sale lot, two and three will be gone by then. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this next book, a serious work of history, terrific work of history. I remember I read it and loved it. Uh, even though I didn't agree with almost anything that was in it, I read it and loved it and then got rid of it somehow. I got rid of it even though it was getting uh, critical attention left, right, and center. Uh, so I was very happy to find it again. It's by Jeffrey Robertson, and it's called The Tyrannic, the Tyrannicide Brief. As you can tell from the cover, it's, it's about the execution of King Charles I, but it takes a twist because it's about... Uh, it's not even just about his trial. It's about the lawyer, uh, John Cook, who took on the case of trying the king, and who had to invent new grounds to do it. It couldn't be treason. Because in, in English legal tradition, treason is committed against a king. A king cannot commit treason. Uh, and this starts off, the author lays his cards on the table right away. Uh, this is the story of an obscure lawyer once called upon to make history. The severed head that spoiled Pepys, that Samuel Pepys' pleasant view of, over London, had previously been attached to body parts inspected by John Evelyn, another diarist whose wit has proved congenial to modern times. He gloated, oh, the miraculous providence of God, at the sight of a basket just brought from the gallows to feed the stray dogs at Aldersgate. It contained hearts, testicles, and penises, mangled and cut and reeking of men hanged, drawn, and quartered at Charing Cross. One was John Cook, for the past decade a judge acclaimed for law reform and for the championing of the poor, the first to propose a host of institutions we now take for granted, including a national health service and legal aid. Cook had been executed for demanding the kind of justice that, 350 years later, the world at last would want, the ending of impunity for rulers responsible for making war on their own people. That such a man should have been torn quite literally to pieces after a rigged trial at the Old Bailey remains one of English history's most shameful episodes, 
whitewashed by lawyers and ignored by historians. Today, John Cook is only mentioned as a passing wraith in books which dismiss him as an embittered Puritan fanatic or as a dodgy lawyer prepared to do the dirty work for the rising Cromwell. Uh, these characters are so at odds with the actual records his published writings, the transcript of his speeches, and what can be gleaned of his personal life, that fairness requires a belated defense for this bravest of all barristers who died for the highest principle of advocacy. So there you know the author right away is sympathizing with Cook, who put his king on trial. Uh, and I, I, I read this when it originally came out. This was in 2007, I think. Uh, when was this? 2005. This came out in 2005. I read it, and I, I, I liked it, but I argued with it, and I wanted to keep it. I don't know why I didn't. And I read all of... It got lots and lots of uh, reviews, and I read all of those. A lot of them were spectacular. I don't think I have any of them yet, or I've stuffed them in this book. Uh, but I was I was very happy to find this at the Brattle, now that I, then I know that it's a keeper of a volume of history. And then the last book I want to show you is an, an example of another uh, axiom of the Brattle. One, the, the one with the Fidesos book is... You know, you can't push the karma of the brattle, of the sale lot. Uh, you, if you see something that is part of a series, go with the flow. Don't stand there and cross your arms, stomp your feet, and say, well, that's not the whole series. I want the whole series. Get what's there, because the rest will probably be coming. And another axiom of the brattle, my foremost, my oldest axiom of the brattle, is simple. It's the brattle will provide. When, in the course of your bookish life, you are, I read feverishly, as you know, I read widely, I read all the time. So I'm constantly bumping against things and thinking, oh, I wish I had a copy of that. And uh, a lot of you don't have access to a place like the Brattle, so when you have an urge like that, you sit on it, you think about it, and then if it sticks with you and you know you want to act on it, you go to a book depository or Amazon or something like that and you order a copy. I don't ever do that. I don't ever do that. Instead, I have the Brattle. And the Brattle will provide. And ordinarily, the Brattle provides in a timely fashion, although this particular example is pretty darn timely. Just recently, here on this channel, I got a new book by Harold Hoser, uh, a biography of a, of a great sculptor, the guy who sculpted the Abraham Lincoln statue in the Lincoln Memorial. And that gave me the perfect opportunity to praise Harold Hoser as a biographer and a writer about Lincoln whose book, Lincoln and the Power of the Press, for instance, was reviewed widely. And in that video, which can't have been more than a couple of days ago, uh, I praised above all a book that, that Harold Hauser wrote on President-elect Lincoln, on Lincoln in between when he was elected and when he took office. Those of you maybe not familiar with American politics will, uh, will need reminding that, uh, very oddly, we have a long interval <laughs> in this country. We always have where the president is elected, but he doesn't take office for a long time, for a long time, long enough for buyer's remorse to set in. Uh, and in Lincoln's case, uh, that was especially important because the interval between when he, took, uh, when he was elected and when he took office was a crucial period for a lot of southern states seceding from the Union or talking about seceding from the Union. Things reached a, feature, a fevered pitch in that brief interval. And Harold Hoser wrote a book about it. He wrote a book about President-elect Lincoln that is incredibly good. You would think it would only be a footnote in any Lincoln book, but no. He's so good that he made it fantastic. And in the course of that earlier video, I said, I don't have a copy of President-elect Lincoln, but I am sure the Brattle will provide. And it did. <laughs> so there you go. I now have a copy of President-elect Lincoln by Harold Hoser. This is the Lincoln book that I wanted. The, the one about the, the sculptor, I will read and I will really like, but I'm not sure that I will keep it. But this is a keeper of a book about Lincoln. So, and, and the Brattle provided it. So there you go. So that was, my, uh, that was my Brattle trip today. I'm sure that in time, the good memories will surface and outlast the bad memories, which are being beer-breathed upon by a whole bunch of people who don't have two, I, two IQ points to rub together. As I was leaving, as I was making my way back to the subway to come back to the bean, I was watching these people just staggering everywhere in all directions in their Patriots jerseys and their Patriots face paint and their Patriots hats. At, at noon. It was noon. 
And they were already, all of them, sousing drunk. But when I was leaving the brattle, a young woman wandered in. She staggered in with her friends, walked up to the to the cash register and said to the young woman who was standing there, Can I offer you $20 to use your bathroom? It's like a wicked emergency. And the, the young woman at the counter had already been told by the manager on duty at the brow that the answer to that question is no. <laughs> Absolutely not. And the minute that the young woman who had asked the question realized that she was going to get resistance, she said, How oh, about forty dollars? I like wicked have to go. <laughs> I'm thinking I w I wouldn't say anything, of course, but I was thinking, well, you know, Young lady, $40 is the ticket that you would get from the cop for peeing in an alley. So why don't you just do that? Instead of putting this young person on the spot with a rule that they don't want. It be, especially since you are obviously going to urinate on the floor and then vomit on the walls and then pass out in a locked bathroom, which requires EMTs to come and axe you out of. In other words, you're going to cost the shop $250, $300, and the young woman you're asking and offering twenty dollars to is going to have to mop up your urine and your vomit. <laughs> no amount of money is worth that, and that is obvious. Obviously, what's going to happen? That's why when you walk, when you stagger up the street today, you're going to find that even restaurants aren't letting you use the bathroom. That's why <laughs> it's not policy; it's you. <laughs> but I was watching these people, and I was thinking, I know what all these people are going to do. They weren't interested in books. <laughs> Absolutely not. They weren't interested in books. I, I was standing there out in the, the sale lot. I heard the same thing I always hear from passersby. Only these were drunk passersby saying, Oh, look, they got books on shine. Oh, your books get real wet in the rain, I'll bet. Yeah, because the shop leaves them out in the rain. <sighs> I was thinking, I was watching these people, and I was thinking, I know what you're going to do. I know exactly what you're going to do. Half of you are going to get on the green line, go out to Lansdowne Street, and keep drinking at apocalyptic levels until 4 tomorrow morning. And the other half, if you were going to get on the orange line and go out to South Boston and do the same thing, keep drinking at apocalyptic levels until 4 in the morning. By this time tomorrow, the hospitals in the greater Boston area will have reported well over 400 cases of alcohol poisoning and well over 100 deaths. <laughs> and, and that's what you're going to say. To your grandkid, you're going to say, yeah, I, you once had, uh, you know, my sister, your grandmother, would be here. Uh, you know, your grand aunt would be here. Uh, but when she was 18, she drank herself to death because the Patriots won a football game. <laughs> and we'll always remember the day. We'll, we'll commemorate it by getting blastingly drunk. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was watching these young people. I was thinking, that's what you're going to do with your next 17 hours. Your next 17 hours are going to be marathon, staggering amounts of drinking. And, I, you know, if that's how they enjoy themselves, but all I can think, I have this, this, this stack of books here that I'm just going to curl up with some of these things. I have this, this stack of nifty books. And I was just thinking, oh, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> I, thought, I thought the same thing that readers always think. I, I looked at these people and thought, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so that was my brattle trip. That was a, a Patriot's Day brattle trip. Oh my God, what was I thinking? For books that I don't, I love. I love what I got, but I do not need. They were. Uh, they weren't worth. The, uh, anyway, I shopped among the face painters for you. <laughs> but now I'm back, and uh, the whole rest of the day is going to be reading and writing. So the memory will soon be long gone. <laughs> but I will report back, and I will see you soon. Thank you, book two.